Peace be with you too, and I invite all of us to stand and greet one another in Christian love at this time. As you're finding your way back to your seats, I have a few announcements to lift up for you. This week in our In Touch, you'll see uh, a day of unity of service in the cover, and then other announcements on the inside. This is our very first unity of service day. It'll be October 11th. Registration comes online today for a variety of mission projects and ways to be in service with uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ here at church. You can come as a family, you can come uh, alone and meet new people. Um, there's all sorts of sites that are here at the church and then off-site as well. Uh, so please do visit the ministry center or go online to see all of the opportunities for you to be in service together. Uh, also, if you're currently serving on our audio video teams or our stream team on our website, uh, you're invited to come to the Volunteer Center this Thursday at 6.30 for a monthly meeting. Uh, anyone who is fifth grade or older can join these teams, um, and it'll be a great time to have some training, no experience is necessary. All adults in the church are invited to our next Encore event, which is Wednesday, October 1st, from noon to 1.30. We'll start with a fellowship lunch and then move into a program. And this month, the program will feature the sights and sounds of the Crown Jewels of Europe Christ Church Choir Tour. Some of you know a lot about that. Uh, please register with Jan Randolph about that this week. And then lastly, if you're a parent and you have small children and you would like a break and get out, uh, there is a parents' night out coming up. The Youth of Christ can help you out on October 10th from 6 to 10 p.m. by watching your kids. And uh, the cost starts at only $15. And this will help you and help them raise money for their trips and other youth program expenses. 
Let us give thanks to God for these opportunities to be in ministry and fellowship together. Thanks be to God.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. All of this is God's gift offered to us without Christ. Uh, Christopher, Tiffany, and Anna come this morning to, to, to bring their son Preston. Uh, they brought a cheering squad with them. We invite all of them to come to come. So the three questions that we asked you this morning on behalf of the whole church. The two of you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness. Do you reject the evil powers of this world? Do you repent of your sins? If so, say I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God has given you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression, however it may come? If so, say I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, promise to serve Him as your Lord? If so, say I do. We nurture this child in Christ's holy church. By your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, profess his faith openly, and to lead a, a life following Christ. Say, I do. All right, so we ask the congregation this question. It takes an entire congregation to raise a child in the Christian faith. So we ask you, will you be the family of faith for these people? That means some of you will have to teach Sunday school. Some of you will have to be in the youth group. Some of you will have to drive on youth outings. Uh, some of you will have to make food for youth, uh, for, for youth dinners, and they eat a lot. Uh, uh, um, what we're saying is that we as a church family today are accepting the responsibility to be a family which models the Christian faith so that as Preston grows up, he may see that all around him. If you as a church family will take that responsibility, please say we will. We will. All right. We have your names. Okay. Let us pray. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water, that those who receive it may find themselves living and raising with Christ and sharing in this final victory all the days of their life. Amen. Can I take you a minute? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I know that feeling. What name is given the child? Preston Monroe Arena. Whoa, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want you to meet some people. This is your new church family, Preston. Uh, I don't know their names either, it's okay. <laughs> Paparazzi over here. <laughs> and these people are gonna be surrounding you and they will spy on you and tell your parents everything you're doing the rest of your life. And I have been told that I'm in trouble if the choir does not see this child. So. This is the choir. This is Ms. LaHonda, and this is Preston. The newest member of Christ Holy Church. Let us pray. Father, I ask you to work in Preston's life, that he will early come to put his faith in you, he will discover he can trust you and know that you are trustworthy. Watch over him and over his parents. Give them sleep and give them peaceful rest as they raise him in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Got a big sister to help too, right? All right. Thank you so much for coming up. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to page 755. You'll find Psalm 24 there. Let us stand as together we read and sing our Psalter today. 
those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and who do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek the Lord, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the ruler of glory may come in. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the ruler of glory may come in. Who is this ruler of glory? The Lord. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I think we have the children's choir, and some of you may be returning to your family. So there's the children's choir later. Go ahead. In preparation for this morning's scripture lesson, uh, please join me in the prayer of illumination printed in your book. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit that we may hear your word with joy. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is from Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 11. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their faith those who hate him. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws I give you today. The word of God for the people of God.
Thank you to the choir for that. 38 years ago, uh, Ken Minima came to the seminary I was going to in Boston and uh, sang that, first time I ever heard it, and uh, had a profound impact for a couple of reasons uh, and created a friendship as well that has lasted 38 years. So thank you for that. I'll tell you more of that story when we have uh, some time Wednesday in your rehearsal. Uh, so uh, we're reading from the Hebrews today, the letter uh, written by an unknown writer uh, of the New Testament. Some will say it is Apollos, others will say it may be Barnabas. Um, no one's really quite sure. Whoever it is says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up that meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Just in case you missed it, uh, we're doing this little sermon series during these weeks. Uh, we're taking it from Acts 2.42, and we're talking about what are the four marks of a living faith. Uh, you will uh, find them listed in Acts 2.42. It, it says that the church which added 3,000 to its number on one day devoted itself first to the apostles' teaching, to the didache, that is the word of God, the scriptures is what we would call it, and second to the fellowship. Uh, the koinonia, we get our word communion from that. Uh, and then third, to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. We'll come back next week and the following week and talk about breaking of bread and prayer. But today the focus is on fellowship, koinonia, koinonia. And what fellowship is supposed to be, what it's supposed to be is something different than what it often is, isn't it? Because I have to say, sometimes the church does not quite rise to what it's supposed to be doing, especially when you compare it to other, uh, other experiences out there. Uh, last night, many of you were with us. We went to uh, Constellation Field to the Skeeters to the, to the uh, baseball game. Uh, it was Faith and Family Night. Our church sponsors that every year. Uh, Todd Harris, our youth director, threw out one of the opening pitches. Uh, he and several children uh, were, were, were there doing that, and he did a great job with that. Uh, his son swept home plate. That was nice. Our choir sang God Bless America in the seventh inning stretch. That was very nice. Uh, several of our youth uh, participated in some of the activities, and I said the opening prayer. All of which is enough to say, I'm calling that an official worship service of Christ United Methodist Church. Okay? So... Uh, so if you notice, our worship attendance this weekend is six, seven thousand. Uh, that's perhaps why. Okay. What amazed me though was how much fun people seem to be having. Everybody except the Skeeters who, who lost five to one. Uh, but there was something going on to keep kids of all ages busy. Uh, and it made me wonder, maybe we should put over in this transept a splash pad. Okay. And then it could double as the baptistry font. Uh, we should put over here maybe a carousel uh, or at least uh, someplace selling barbecue, uh, hot dogs, <laughs> things like that. And the choir can run the bases between the pulpit and the lectern and then down to the back and back and forth. Church should be fun, shouldn't it? <laughs> Now, I realize that some people at the game last night uh, were perhaps, um, let's see, how do we say this? Uh, their fun was perhaps alcohol-induced. Um, there was some beer flowing there. And we're not doing that. Uh, 
But we ought to be at least as joyful in church as those people were there, shouldn't we? Uh, sometimes it's not. That's a shame. Now, part of that is because, as some of you know, churches can sometimes be places of conflict more than they can be places of encouragement. I think of a Methodist church put up on its marquee, a uh, sign, a message. I don't think it's what they exactly meant to say. It read simply, don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> Maybe how some folks have experienced church in their lives. <laughs> it's not supposed to be that way. The church is intended to be a fellowship in which everyone finds not just a relief from the worries of life, but they find a genuine salve for the soul, a tonic uh, for their disposition that is encouraging and inspiring. Because when it comes down to it, what Christian fellowship is all about is simply loving God and loving each other. John Wesley, the founder of our church, said, watching over each other in love. Uh, that's with or without a covered dish dinner. See, that's what this little passage in Hebrews 10 is all about. When you boil it all down, uh, what the writer wants to tell us is that there are a few things we really ought to be quick to embrace if we're serious about this thing we call faith uh, Christians talk about all the time. First, he said, let us draw near to God. And then secondly, let us hold on to our hope. Uh, and third, let us consider how we can encourage and love each other. I have a feeling... Each of those admonitions should be the watchword of our lives if we want to follow Jesus. Now, to be sure, to the Jews at least, the exhortation to draw near to God was a very striking notion. Everybody knew in the Hebrew faith that wasn't how it worked. In the Hebrew system, there were all kinds of barriers that restricted an individual's private personal access when it came to where the presence of the living God was thought to actually dwell. Uh, from the time of Moses, in fact, uh, Jews believed that there was a sacred curtain, there was a sacred hedge which separated the Holy of Holies, the innermost part of the temple, from the rest of it. And it was so exclusive that only one man in the whole nation, the high priest, could enter into that Holy of Holies only one day of the year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And even then, only under fixed conditions. A little like going to see the great Oz, if you will. Uh, not just anybody could, could go in, uh, but even if you could do so, like the cowardly lion, you would find it was a pretty fearful place to, act, to actually enter. But now, so Hebrews 10 tells us, all of us, all of you, you and me, all of us, uh, dear brothers and sisters, we have now been given the confidence to draw near to God, to freely enter the most holy place where he is to be found. All we have to do is come with a sincere heart and in the certainty of the clear-headed convictions of our faith. James 4, 8 will go on to say, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. That's amazing, isn't it? If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. What an astounding change that represented. Uh, th this new living approach, the, the word would suggest even previously unavailable pathway, which Christ has opened up to us this morning. Which is why, secondly, we are encouraged to hold on unswervingly, to keep a tight grip, sort of like this little guy. One which does not bend to the hope which we profess. For he who promised is faithful. This is really important. Because I think you would agree, we live in a world uh, this morning which is pretty shy on hope in many places. The news today from the Middle East is frightening. The terrorist ISIS group the continued unrest in Syria, uh, the, the absolute pandemonium that exists in, in Gaza. But even if you put aside all of the questions of terrorism, uh, some are anxious about other things this morning, about their health, or maybe they're anxious about their jobs, the economic uh, indicators notwithstanding. I heard of a corporate executive who lost his job. He was so depressed, he couldn't go home. He didn't tell his family what had happened. 
And so instead, he took a long walk in a park. He found a bench where he could sit down and bemoan what had happened to him. After a little while, a second man came up, equally depressed. He sat on the other end of the bench and looked over and saw the, this corporate former vice president with his hand, his head in his hands, moaning. And he said, what's, what's wrong with you? The man said, I've lost my job. I can't go home and tell my family. What's your problem? But the man said, well, I run a circus. The main attraction in my circus has been a gorilla, which is huge and threatening. People come from all over the world just to, just to watch that gorilla rant and rage at them. But two days ago, that gorilla died, and I know my circus won't be able to survive that loss. The vice president thought a minute, and then he said, hey, you need a gorilla? I need a job. <laughs> Why don't I dress up in a gorilla suit and pretend to be your ranting gorilla? Circus manager agreed. The days that followed, the corporate executive who had dressed up in the gorilla suit raged and ranted so much, he probably practiced in the office. <laughs> Record crowds came. Then one day, by sheer accident, a lion ended up in the same cage with the gorilla. And as the crowd began to gather, the lion and the, and the gorilla circled each other. And finally, the, 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 the fake gorilla realized he was cornered, so he yelled at the top of his lungs, help! And the lion shouted back, shut up! <laughs> You're not the only one who's out of a job! <laughs> a lot of hopelessness out there this morning. May I tell you that even if we're, if we're like the guy in the gorilla suit, if we're following Jesus, we are not like those who have no hope. Because our hope is not in the leading economic indicators, the Dow Jones Industrial, the markets. Our hope is not in corporate profits. Our hope is not in a winning football team. Although, it would be nice. <laughs> I root for SMU, so you can figure. <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we believe in God, our hope is in a God who transcends all of those things, who does not change His will or His ways, in whom there is no shadow of turning. Which brings us to the third admonition the writer of Hebrews gives us. Therefore, he says, let us consider how we may spur each other on toward love and good deeds. Literally, let us provoke or incite one another to love. The Greek word used in this verse, 24, is a great one. Paroitsis. Paroitsis. Uh, in the field of medicine, a, a, a paroxysm is a sudden or violent outburst or attack or convulsion that intensifies a disease or condition. Some versions even translate this verb then, let us provoke one another or incite one another. Now those have primarily negative connotations to us. That when you provoke people, you clearly set them off. And the only thing I ever remember being talked about I was incited was a riot. St. Paul will tell the, the folks in Corinth in, in, in the first letter, he will say, love is not easily provoked or angered. Power eats no, same word. But love is provoked whenever it is stimulated in the lives of Christians who genuinely care about each other. That's what you and I need to be doing, my friends. We need to be caring about each other and those beyond us. We need to be stirring up a riot of love in this place. So much so that people just driving by this building on Austin Parkway will say, what in the world's happening in that place? That's why we were founded. That's why we exist. That's what has to define us. Paraphrase old Paul, if we ain't got love, we ain't got nothing, have we? Our church ought to be like that proverbial home, home on the range. You know the one where seldom is heard a discouraging word. Doesn't mean we won't disagree sometimes. Certainly will. But the point is, when we do so, we will find ways to express our love, to encourage each other in the faith. And what's more, as our church continues to grow, it is now more important than ever. 
I have to tell you, uh, with all due respect to my friends Tom Pace and Morris Mathis and Mike Mayhew, and they're all friends. Tom, in fact, called me just a few days before my first Sunday here. He said he was sitting with Bishop Huey and with, and with, and with Chuck Simmons, Memorial Drive Methodist Church pastor, and he wanted, them, wanted me to know that three of them were, were uh, uh, talking about me and that two of the three of them were pulling for me. <laughs> I can hear Chuck in the back, so I'm pretty sure he's the one. They're dear friends, but with all respect to them, I have to tell you, I believe the very best days of Christ in the Methodist Church are not behind us, they are ahead of us. Amen? Amen. You know why that is? Because as the choir is saying about Moses, God has a wonderful track record of taking people when they're lost and out there in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness and calling them back and saying, I've got a job for you and I'm going to take you into the promised land of my presence. That's what God does. I believe God is not finished with us. He is just beginning to work out his purpose for our church. I believe, as the famous missionary once said, we can expect great things from God as we attempt great things for him. I believe this fellowship can grow, and that as it does, we're going to be enriched with some of the people whom God's going to bring here, uh, some of whom will look like us, some of whom will not. It won't matter, because if we get this thing down right, we'll all going to look like Jesus. Right? See, that's what the church is supposed to be. Not an outpost of hell. Some churches are. I've been in a church like that. I was in a church many years ago which just loved to fight. That was their favorite indoor sport, was fighting. <laughs> and one day, a man who had been in that church for 45 years died, left $75,000 in his will to the church, no instructions as to how it was to be used. That set off an enormous fight. And in the middle of that board meeting fight about how to use Mr. Floyd's money, I started laughing because I realized Floyd loved a good church fight. <laughs> That's why he did it that way. Just wanted to see. Rather than an outpost of hell, may I suggest to you Churches ought to be little colonies of heaven. <laughs> Maybe the original first colony. <laughs> a place rather like an embassy. You know that if you go into a U.S. embassy anywhere in the world, that when you go inside its walls, that the laws of that country don't apply there. American law applies inside the embassy even in the midst of the most autocratic, dictatorial states in the world. In this place, the ways of the world don't apply here. What applies here? The values of the kingdom of heaven. That's how we operate. Because in this place, everyone is going to be welcome. In this place, everyone is going to be valued. In this place, everyone is going to be loved, even some that are a little hard to love. Yeah. All of which is why the writer of these verses will go on to express one more admonition. Those listeners not give up meeting together. Literally, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves. The episunagogian, you can see the word synagogue in that, in that Greek phrase if you look. Do not forsake the synagoguing of yourself, as some have started to do. Because you see, for the Christian who wants to hold on to the Christian hope, uh, the, the community, the fellowship of the saints, is not simply nice. It's not just a pleasant little, little additive to your world. It, it, it is absolutely vital in order to offer the right mix of accountability and encouragement. Despite what some folks will tell you, we are not self-made. We are not even self-maintained. We need each other. 
about a year or so ago, Julie and I went out to California uh, and we did a wedding there in, in the northern part of that state. And we got the chance to see those giant redwood trees. Uh, they're just amazing, aren't they? What's interesting to me about them is that despite their enormous height, they have a very shallow root system. See, because it's not the, their roots into the ground which support the tremendous weight. It's because their roots interlock with the roots of all the trees around them. That's what supports them. Do I suggest to you, as Christians, we need inter interlocking roots in order to withstand the enormous weights of life? These verses don't mean we have to be at church all the time. God help you if you're at church all the time. I won't because I won't be here all the time. The principle does not have to do with frenzied, frenetic activity. It has to do with consistent involvement in the life of the church. Because a Christian who's not involved in fellowship is like a soldier who doesn't belong to an army, a sailor who doesn't have a ship, a baseball player who isn't on a team, even worse, a tuba player who doesn't have a band. It's possible for them to play a solo, but you've got to ask why. <laughs> sort of like the story of a man who stopped going to church one day. Who knows why? It happens to a lot of people. Kids, kids go off to college. They don't bring them to youth anymore. They buy a beach house. Maybe they get called down there a lot. They start just sleeping in more on Sundays. They just kind of lose interest. After a few weeks, the pastor of that man went to see him. It was a chilly evening, and the pastor found him all by himself at home, sitting in front of a, a blazing fire in his den. And uh, so uh, the man welcomed the pastor in. He knew why he was there. Let him do a big chair by the fire. Waited for the lecture, or at least the questions, to begin. But the pastor didn't say anything. Just sat with the man. After some time, the pastor took the fireplace tongs. He, he carefully picked up one brightly burning ember. He placed it to the one side of the hearth all by itself. Sat back in a chair, sat silent. The host watched all of this in quiet fascination. As the one lone ember's flame began to diminish, there was a momentary pop and a glow, and then its fire was gone. Pretty soon it was cold and dead as a doornail. Not a word had been spoken since the initial greeting at the door. Just before the pastor was about to leave, he picked up with the tongs the cold dead ember and he, and he placed them back in the middle of the fire. And immediately that ember began to glow once more with the light and warmth of the burning coals all around it. As the pastor reached the door to leave, his host said simply, thank you so much for your visit, especially for that fiery sermon. I'll be back in church next Sunday. It really is simple, isn't it? Let us draw near to God with sincere hearts. The certainty of knowing that if we draw near to Him, He will draw near to, 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 to us. Let us hold fast to the hope we have. Let us encourage each other, provoke each other, and let us not give up the assembling of ourselves and do a real and vital fellowship. Set aflame by the Holy Spirit of God. That's what marked the faith of the first Christian church. A fellowship that attracted 3,000 new believers in one single day, without even counting a Skeeter's home game attendance. What do you say? We follow suit. Devote ourselves, our best efforts, our best affections to starting a riot of love in this place. I just wonder what God might do with that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Father, thank you for calling us together as a faith family to praise you and worship you for who you are and what you have done for us all in your Son, Jesus Christ. For you, Lord Jesus, our, our High Priest, who has opened up the way for us all to God in your sacrifice on our behalf. Build up this household of faith today, we pray, O God, that by your sanctifying grace you would help us to grow in our knowledge of you and in our love for one another as we bear one another's burdens, as we listen to one another as we connect with and care for one another. We ask for your guidance today, O oh God, upon this, your church, and upon the global church, that even today is attempting to serve and see your kingdom come in its fullness here on earth. Bring deliverance and redemption to the persecuted church today, for those who dare to speak your name even at the risk of their very lives. Speak wisdom to the leaders of our world that they may be peacemakers and instruments of your blessing and will. Holy Spirit, bring comfort and peace to those who may be living in fear, or suffering from depression, those living in economic uncertainty, and those facing the uncertainties of illness. Let your light and your healing come to such as these with the hope that it brings. And to these also whom we name silently before you now. Thank you, Lord, that in the midst of uncertainty, we can be certain of your presence and of your love and of your grace. Be our rock and our fortress in the midst of changing times. We pray that the joy of your salvation would come to those who are taking those initial steps of faith and also to those of us who have been on the journey with you for some time. Hear our prayers, O Lord, as now we join together in the prayer you taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our registration pads are in the pews. I invite you to fill in your information and pass it to your neighbor. If you're visiting with us, we're delighted that you chose to worship with us today. Thank you.
to close our service this morning singing the hymn that uh, Beth just played for us so magnificently. Uh, I now invite you, as we sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, uh, to uh, be a little less rigid, if at all possible. Um, you feel free to lean a little, if you want to, as we sing this. Uh, you feel free to enjoy this hymn uh, and to let it be a reflection of the joy of the Lord, which is supposed to be in this place. Now, if you do not have a church family, if you are looking for one, we would be delighted and honored to have you be a part of this church family. Just come forward as we as we sing this hymn. If you would like prayer for someone, our prayer partners will be up here. They'll be happy to also pray with you. Shall we lean on the everlasting arms? simple. Um, I want you to find somebody you know that does not have a faith family. Someone who's not in a church. I want you to invite them, but not just say, well, come visit our church someday uh, before Jesus comes back. Uh, I want you to say, will you come with me to church this Sunday? I'll come by. I'll pick you up. I'll sit with you in church, and I'll take you to lunch afterwards. Okay? <laughs> It's worth the investment, friends. Uh, go find somebody that does not have a faith family and invite them in. You say, okay, I, I'm just too shy for that. Okay, here's your alternative assignment. Okay? If somebody in this church is mad at you or you're mad at them, this week you pick up the phone or you send them an email or you write them a handwritten note and you say, you know what? I forgot what we were mad about. I love you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you send it to them because we are going to be a fellowship bounded only by the love of Christ. So go forth to be the people of God in this place and beyond these walls. May all who encounter in you, those to whom love has been a stranger, find in you generous friends. And the blessing of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.